Is short here, joined by Eric Samolski, and we are live on the NBC Sports YouTube page, and we're here to talk fantasy baseball. Uh, this is going to be our regular slot throughout the season, uh, 1 p.m. on Tuesday. So make sure to remember that first of all. But um, opening day approaching very, very quickly. We're actually going to have some games that count this week with the Dodgers and the, and the Padres. Uh, but lots of folks are still drafting, so. We can get into that. We can get into some of the headlines over the past day. Uh, but Eric, uh, good to have you here. Um, and I'm excited. We're going to have real games that that count in like 48 hours or less. Yeah, le- less. Yeah, less. it's going to be yeah. it's going to be wild. Um, uh, we'll have the the games live, and then we'll be able to watch the rebroadcast. Um, you know, I think the yeah. rebroadcast starts like 3 p.m. tomorrow, something like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it'll be it'll be good to see some some live. You know. I guess we could say we could call it baseball that counts. Yes, baseball that counts. It's weird though, for sure, because like some leagues are counting it, some leagues aren't, some leagues are still drafting. Right. So it's a little, it's a little, and the, obviously the start time is different. But um, you understand why why Major League Baseball is is doing it. It's it's a cool yeah. thing for sure. It wasn't, and you know, we we had opening day games in Japan in years past. Um, oh, I remember drafting Matt Olson, and then having him like you know have the hamate injury in For japan sure. and being like oh okay so like the season hasn't started and i lost my first baseman um so yeah. with the way things are going um that might happen tomorrow as well we just have to hope uh you know that we can get out of these games unscathed so we're gonna give a few minutes for folks to add some questions to the queue here. Please, please do um anything that's on your mind right now there's certainly so much going on um, both on the field and off. We had a big development. Uh, last night with the Giants signing Blake Snell, we waited all winter and it took until March 18th. Not official yet, but reportedly two years, $62 million with the Giants. The deal includes an opt-out after the first season. <clears throat> the defending National League Cy Young Award winner had to wait until March 18th to sign with a team. Had a 2-2-5 ERA a last season to win the Cy Young Award. Joins a rotation, which is an interesting group, I would say. Uh, Logan Webb, uh, of course, the steady hand at the top. You have Jordan Hicks, who the Giants signed this offseason. Alex Cobb coming back from hip surgery. It seems like he'll be back sooner than a lot of people originally thought. Yeah. Robbie Ray down the line, who they acquired this offseason. And Kyle Harrison, the, the youngster that everybody's excited about. He's had a really good spring. You add that to the rest of the offseason acquisitions that the Giants have made. On the offensive side of the ball, uh, Jung Hu Lee, Jorge Soler, Matt Chapman, the Giants are suddenly pretty, they're a plucky group. They're pretty interesting, I think. Yes, uh, they have the unfortunate distinction of being in the same division as the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, and I think that that has overshadowed their offseason, in addition to overshadowing just the talent on the team. Um, you know, I there are question marks. In the rotation, obviously, there are question marks on not only the health, how long these guys are going to go. You know, can Cobb stay healthy? Can Hicks last as a starter? Yeah. Um, you know, Harrison was super four seam fastball dependent last year. He added the cutter. Is that enough? Um, Snell, you know, way outproduced most of his you know underlying metrics last year. Um, got very like, had, had very very high end results with runners on base but got a lot of runners on base because of walks and hits and stuff like that so you know does that balance out so there's a lot of of question marks there and the the top part of the lineup is good and then you get to like the bottom part of the lineup and you're looking at like Conforto, Mike Yastrzemski, Patrick Bailey, Nick Ahmed and it's it becomes a little bit more questionable um and those guys are solid listen i don't want to talk badly about michael conforto to you um (laughs) but i like there's nothing wrong with those guys but they're not they don't fill you with fear they're they are solid players um but it is definitely a weaker part of the lineup than you know you're going to get with some of these other teams within their own division as well so what about snell going to san francisco fantasy wise because i feel like a lot of folks you know, saw the 229 ERA last year, and we're kind of like, eh, it was a little bit fortunate. You know, the control is not great. We know that. Um, 
San Diego to San Francisco, is it kind of like a lateral move fantasy wise for you? Yeah, I moved him a little bit. Um, like I moved him up a little bit because I did like the team context. Um, and you're not getting you're not getting like any change in the division. I mean, that was one thing with like Dylan Cease going was like, yes, he moved to a better park, but also, you know, he's gonna face a tougher division than when he was in the AL Central. Um, it's weirdly like a park downgrade for um for Snell because Petco Park um, was the second worst park for hitters, according to uh, StatCast's park factors at the three-year rolling average. Um, and San Francisco Giants are uh, 20, that's 24th. So it's still a good pitching park. It is not as good a pitching park as Petco. Um, yeah. And it's a little, this has Dylan Cease vibes to me in that you rank Snell and you draft Snell not really because of the team context or the park, but it's your belief in the health, your belief in the command. He's thrown over 130 innings once since 2018. Um, he has never walked. He has never had under 3.19 walks per nine in a season. Yeah. So he will always walk about 3.2 guys per nine, right? So do you believe he's going to pitch 150, 160 innings? Um, are you okay with the likely outsized whip? Um, you know, I, I don't, I think one, one, nine for his whip last year is going to be something in the mid one twos now. Cause it's just going to like regress to the, the norm based on sure. what he was as his walk rates and hit rates and stuff. So, I mean, to me that the park doesn't matter as much as just your belief in his health and skills. So just putting fantasy aside just for a quick second. You know, the Padres getting Dylan Cease last week. Which team do you think is a better team uh, today? The Giants or the Padres? It's tough. It is tough. I think I have to go with the Padres. Um, yeah, so more star power still. Yeah. I And, you know, I am a believer in Joe Musgrove. Um, you know, I don't care about the spring stats when it comes to that. I mean, I think, you know, you... I, I have an article coming out tomorrow about Joe Musgrove's new sweeper, but where he mentions that he's he doesn't care about results in the spring because all he's doing is trying to throw different pitches and see what feels good and what doesn't. And if a pitch doesn't feel good, he starts throwing it more until he gets more comfortable with it. So, like, I think that's a, a, an interesting reason to throw out certain spring stats. So, like, Darvish, Musgrove, Cease, Michael King, like, that's a pretty good top four of your rotation. And then even though the Giants have good hitters, they don't, to me, have something that matches Bogarts, Tatis Jr., Machado. You know, that's a pretty good top three. Um, you know, I like Hassan Kim. Um, I know fantasy-wise people are down on him because of the power, but just like as a real player, oh, I yeah. think he's yeah, really good. I think Jake Cronenworth is another guy who's a solid real-life player. He can do a little bit of everything. Um, we'll see what happens with Jackson Merrill. Like, I, I just think it's it's as interesting, if not a better lineup. And I like the pitching better. Um, the bullpen isn't as good, though. So, you know, that is an edge to the Giants. So uh, we will uh, grab your questions here, start going through them. Uh, feel free to add to the to the queue here if you have anything on your mind. We'll be here probably for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, before we get into that, though, we are closing in on opening day, like I said, but it's never too late to squeeze in another draft. So for those cramming before the regular season begins, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Uh, we also update it based on injuries and signings and all that good stuff. So it'll continue to be updated this week. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code baseball24 to get 10% off at checkout. Remember that promo code baseball24 to get 10% off at checkout. So we'll start here with Dave's question on uh, Yuri Perez with the Marlins, which is a, is a shame because uh, for the last couple of starts, he it was a like a finger issue that he was dealing with. And his most recent outing, he left and everyone was like, oh, it's got to be a finger again. But it turns out it's actually some some elbow discomfort. 
Um, he's going to be evaluated. I, I don't think we've seen any updates since uh, a couple since, of days ago. Still pretty concerning, I think. Yeah, since the 16th. So today is the 19th. On the 16th, we heard he was going to visit a surgeon, you know, to get consultation from a surgeon. And we have heard literally nothing since then. Yeah. Um, so it could be absolutely nothing. It could be major elbow surgery. Like we, we have no clue. Um, and that that makes it hard for me to draft him unless he's just like, unless people are totally hands off him and he's going in like the Bradish Senga range of guys who we know are managing injuries. But as of right now, that's not what's happening. But that's my take is until I hear anything, that's the only range I could take him in because with pitchers dropping like flies, I, I, I can't take him earlier in the draft when I know he's hurt and I just don't know how badly he's hurt. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, Garrett Cole, we've gotten a little more clarity on his situation, but it still seal it still seems kind of tenuous. It seems like um, it's more of a nerve thing than a, than a ligament thing, but we shall see. I still would be reluctant to draft Garrett Cole as well. I think they all go in that similar bucket right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, up next, Dad uh, asks, <laughs> do you feel Henry Davis has breakout potential this year? Any idea how many times he was behind the dish over the spring? I don't know the answer to that second question. You, you might have a better idea, Eric. Um, I will actually, I I can check that out, um, I believe. We'll, we'll look at some of our um, our resources to check that out, like MLB playing time and, and things of that. Oh, that's not by position. Well, anyway, um, I will. I'll look into that as we're talking. I I do think he has breakout potential when you factor in that we're talking about a catcher, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think he has breakout potential in the sense that he is going to set the world on fire as just a regular offensive player. Um, I think you know the going to drive line this off season to unlock some power is has been nice, um, and I think that um you know he could hit 20 home runs you know with a solid kind of like for a catcher again like 250 ish batting average um and you know he's going to get some chip and uh, steals he stole 13 bases last year across his three nice. levels so maybe he gets like 10 or 11 um so you know 250 20 home runs 10 steals is a pretty good line for a catcher um right. but i don't know that that's like you're not talking about that as like full on breakout. Yeah, I I love him late, and it's you know it's become pretty popular because you assume uh, last year when Davis was up, of course he was an outfielder. Plans changed um, due to the injury of the catcher, who I will not name, former Mets prospect. Uh, you can mention, him, but I'm I'm still a, a bit sad about that. Although they have Francisco Alvarez, so you know, true. Um, it, uh, Andy Rodriguez, uh, uh, who's really supposed to be a good good player but he's out all season so we'll see a lot of henry davis he's caught a lot this spring too uh according to what i see here he's caught uh 12 games this spring and part of that's because of the yasmani grandal situation mm -hmm. with the uh, plantar fasciitis um and so he's gotten a lot of playing time behind the plate and looked good and i'm not hearing a lot of progress for grandal so but I think Davis is in good position. If Grandal was healthy for most of the spring, maybe we would be having a different conversation. But um, I do like him, you know, assuming he gets that catcher eligibility quick. Uh, he's a nice, like, little cheat code at the catcher position, I think. Yeah, I, th I think they have said that he is, go like, he is going to catch. They said that they, you know, that I don't think they have another plan for him, really. Yeah. Um, and so... I think you have to expect, especially like if you're in a Yahoo league, right, where it takes five games, um, he's going to pick that up pretty quickly. Um, and so I think, you know, in that format, you move quickly. All of them, you need to make sure you have a backup catcher, right? If, in, even if it's for one week in Yahoo, in NFBC formats, it might take three weeks. Who knows? Um, but, you know, that the production he gives you as a hitter is going to be fine to keep in the lineup. It's not like he is, you know, somebody you have to keep pinned to your bench until he gets catcher value. Right. Uh, so another question here uh, from Brady, uh, 
I have one spot available to add any of these in a head-to-head 12-team league. How would you rank these players? Uh, Kyle Stowers had a three-homer game the other day, uh, kind of throwing himself back into the playing time mix there, though I think it still will be tricky. Uh, Kobe Mayo um, hits, I mean, he's the power, the raw power that he has is incredible. Henry Davis, who we just talked about. Um, we're talking, though, start of the season. Which who would you rather have? What's your order here? Um, I, I think I have to put Henry Davis first because I know he's yeah. on the team. Um, and catcher outfield eligibility is is valuable throughout the year just to to balance injuries. Um, I think I put Kobe Mayo second and Kyle Stowers third. Um, I think Colton Cowser is still ahead of, of Stowers. Um, and I don't think either one of them breaks camp with the Orioles. Um, and I think Mayo is probably ahead of both of them. And I don't think he breaks camp with the Orioles, but I feel better about Mayo pushing into the starting lineup because I'm not a huge Jordan Westberg believer. And so I think it's far more likely that we see Mayo up at third base holiday at second then I think it is that the Orioles push Austin Hayes out the door in left field, which I think will will take some time. You know what I love about Yahoo Leagues is that if you can customize the the positions, you can add an NA spot, mm-hmm. um, which I think is like a fun little wrinkle, especially with teams. My, um, my home league just did that. Yeah, it's yeah. great. So especially, you know, we know teams are kind of incentivized to bring up these young players earlier. So I would suggest if you're doing a league this week or next week, you know, if you're the commissioner or you talk to your commissioner, talk with your league mates, get an NA spot. So it just adds a really fun wrinkle, I think, to the end mm-hmm. of drafts uh, for a player you can stash and not have to worry about them taking up a bench spot or like an IL spot and you're juggling stuff. I think it'd be a lot of fun for any league, almost like a keeper that's not, you know, like right. it'd be fun. So something to explore if you if you're still setting up your league. Um this week that'd be highly recommended by me uh and i agree with your order by the way i I like davis mayo stowers too that would have been my my way to go uh up next we have a question from matt of the players with injury stints mostly unknown who are you more comfortable taking closer to their current day adp it's a good, good question um so these are players, I assume, that we know will start the season on the injured list or just players who are kind of like question marks? Yeah, um, I think it's – let's go with players who we know will start the year on the injured list. I think that narrows it down a little bit for us. Right. Um, and then, you know, we can look at like – there's a difference obviously between pitchers and, and hitters. So first I just want to say like, because I was doing our blurbs yesterday, I, I still think people view Corey Seager as being hurt. Um, and he may possibly start the year on the IL, but if he sure. does, it, it's going to be a pretty quick return. Um, so he's the obvious answer for me of somebody who is like in the discourse injured, but I think we'll get back fairly soon. I'm also okay to take Josh Lowe near his yeah. ADP. Um, He's dropped now to like, so in the eight NFBC main events, which happened, which have all happened recently, he's now outside of the top 110. Um, All the indications are that he has a grade one oblique strain, which is like a really minor oblique strain. But because he missed time with his hip injury in the in the spring, they didn't want to rush him back. But he's another person who I expect expect might miss like a couple weeks of the season. Um, nothing crazy. And so I am happy to take him at ADP. And then also Josh Young. Um, Josh Young is another guy who the Rangers said could play in some exhibition games. Like, right. They have like two exhibition games against the Red Sox, like two days before opening day. Yeah. And they say that he's on track to play in those games, whether that means he then starts on the IL or starts in, um, you know, the opening day lineup. I think he's also close. And he's now going in, in NFBC main events. He went pick. Uh, 145 so that was only two picks ahead of jake berger you know who's also a third baseman mm-hmm. um and that was actually 21 picks behind key brian hayes and i like key brian hayes but if if josh young is fully healthy at the start of the year i think you're taking him over key brian hayes all the time 
Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, and I would add Matt McLean to that mix who was hurt mm-hmm. for a bit. I know he had a little bit of a scare yesterday, but should be fine. I like Sonny Gray. Um, oh, yeah. So he's going to miss opening day. The Cardinals just announced um, that uh, Miles Michaelis will start opening day. And I, I made this uh, comment on Twitter that this feels like oddly a year where there's a lot of opening day starters who don't feel like your typical yeah, they- opening day the whole schedules come out and it is wild like Uh, Garrett crochet is starting opening day and i think last night or last week when we did our q a we're like is crochet gonna make the rotation yeah (laughs) so yes he's making the rotation and he's starting an opening day good luck right um Um, yeah yeah, i I love that call i mean because they said he's not gonna make opening day but they didn't say he's not gonna start the season um so i think there's a there's a chance that he at worst misses like one start yeah exactly um so yeah i i i, have, I love sunny gray where he's going and then the other pitchers um it's tough for me like we already know pitchers are a huge injury risk so to take a pitcher who's already injured um yeah. is really really hard obviously if you have il spots it becomes easier to take a guy like you know, a Kyle Bradish or a Kodai Senga or, um, you know, a Garrett Cole because you just throw him on the IL. I guess I'd rather take Bradish of any of those because I know he's currently throwing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, but I really don't, I really don't love any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm fine at the end of a draft with an IL spot taking those guys and hoping for the best. Um, I guess also I would just say maybe Scherzer. You know, Scherzer's injury was, um, you know, he was slowed by a back and then um, but he doesn't have any major elbow concern um, as those other guys do. And right now is trending for a June return. So like maybe you missed two months um, and he's kind of being forgotten about. So, I, you know, but I I don't love it. I'm not targeting any of those guys. Well, while we're talking injuries with pitchers, uh, some closer news over the past 24 hours, uh, Joan Duran to begin the year on the injured list with a moderate oblique strain, which you don't love to hear. And Duran, you know, top of the board among fantasy closers. So if you already did your draft, it kind of is what it is. Um, in his absence, which I would assume would probably be a few weeks, probably most of mm-hmm. April, uh, we'll probably see Griffin Jacks at the top, Brock Stewart also in that mix. Um, and also Jordan Romano, uh, dealing with elbow inflammation, uh, he's getting an in- anti-inflammatory injection. Eric Swanson has right forearm tightness. Right. Who, who would have been the, the guy. Exactly. So you're probably talking like Amy Garcia in the, right. in the Blue Jays bullpen. So if you're drafting this week, in the next couple of days, like we know these guys are top 10 closers, like they mm-hmm. are, if they're healthy. But what do you do now? Like, do they fall to kind of that 15, 20 range among closers? Or, you know, do you dra- still be aggressive with Duran and, you know, try to just piece it together, make sure you get Griffin Jacks late? Right. I think I'm more comfortable drafting Duran because I'm more comfortable with the oblique than the elbow inflammation. Right. Um, I think elbow inflammation from somebody whose job is to throw as hard as they can for one inning um, is troublesome because we know that velocity tends to be linked to injury more often than anything else. So I'm a little more concerned about Jordan Romano than I am about Johan Duran. Um, I will obviously bump Johan Duran down um, my list. And I'm, I would probably rather, I'm not probably, I would rather take, you know, guys like, um, like uh, Josh Hader, who I had underneath him. I'd rather take um, Rizal Iglesias right now. Uh, probably Camilo Duvall too, because again, you're getting, you're missing a month of saves. I'd probably rather take Andres Munoz. Like I might move Duran down in like the Kimbrel, Seawold, Evan Phillips range of closers. Um, And speaking of of injured closers, we don't have any official news on David Bednar um, who hasn't pitched with a lat injury, but he's played, he played catch three days in a row. And then he was on a, uh, uh, spring training broadcast of a Pirates game and when they asked him about his recovery he said that he'll I'll see Yins soon okay so Yins obviously Pittsburgh slang um 
That is not a medical I diagnosis. Um, yeah, Yinzers. I know um, John is Philly. Yeah, Everything yeah, John is Philly. Uh, is Yinzers. everything a Yins? In- I don't. I don't know. But the it's like the terrible towels in Steelers games. They have like ones that say Yins on it and stuff like that. Um, but so the the team wasn't concerned about it. He has already been throwing multiple days in a row, and he says he's going to be back soon. I don't. We don't know if that means he's not going on the IL at all. Or if it means that he's going to go on the IL for a little bit, but I'm I'm happy to take David Bednar at his current draft price, um, which is was 86th overall um, in the main event, which is behind Fairbanks, behind Sewold, one pick before Kimbrel, two picks before Clay Holmes. Like I'd rather have Bednar if the team says he's healthy and he says he's healthy. I just yeah. think there's more saves to be had there. Um, and I guess we should note also Kenley Jansen was scratched again with a back injury today. Um, they're calling it back uh, tightness. So it's not like it, an injury, but at this point he hasn't really thrown this spring and it yeah. seems like all indications are he's not going to be ready for opening day. And while it is not a long-term injury and we don't know how many games the Red Sox are going to win early on, um, it does seem like it would be Chris Martin at the start of the year for the Red Sox. So again, late round, like I would knock Kenley Jansen down a little bit um, in your rankings, but not too much because he might miss a couple of weeks and I would throw a late round flyer on, on Chris Martin. So I know you're a lifetime New Yorker, Eric, but Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. We're talking about Pittsburgh and Philly. Have you ever been to a Wawa or a Sheets? Oh my God. Yeah. So my wife, my wife is originally from um, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And so every time we go visit her family, um, it's mandatory that we stop off at a Wawa. In fact, there is a corner near Allentown uh, that has a Wawa, a Sheets, and then there's a a Yakos, which is Yakos hot dogs. um, And they're all right there on the same corner. And sometimes we do the trifecta and you get a little (laughs) bit at at each one. Um, But yeah, Wawa's, Wawa's phenomenal. Oh, okay. I, I'm so glad you said that. I, I do. I, you have to pick a side and I, I yeah. pick Wawa over sheets. Yeah, me too. My my only the Wawa iced coffee is too sugary for me. Um, okay. But again, my wife as a, a native um, told me that if you do if you mix the hot coffee with the iced coffee and then you add some extra ice, it cuts some of the sweetness of the of the okay. iced coffee. So that's a that's a pretty good trick. And then you don't really need to add like you know the milk and sugar or whatever to it if you if you want it. But yeah. Um and the, the hot and ready like buffalo bites from Wawa gotta do it every time. Cheese filled pretzels like hot my son pretzels. my son is almost two years old now loves a cheese filled pretzel. Um yeah. Right. Big Wawa fan that kid. Uh, they're not up here in New York, which is just should be I mean that's that's a shame. Right. Also, we we are not sponsored by Wawa. This is oh. just DJ and I talking about Wawa. You know what? You gotta look into that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> okay, another question here from Rady. Who has a better probability of making a comeback, Ryan Weathers or Sixto Sanchez? I keep reading they've had great spring training. So with everybody injured on the Marlins <laughs> rotation, <laughs> I, I, I think Rod, Ryan Weathers is going to crack that rotation. Sixto Sanchez probably not cracking the rotation, but he has looked good. I, I saw him uh, against the Mets over the weekend. He pitched two innings. Looks good. Looks different than I remember. Let's put that out there. But he's been good this spring. He's out of options. So we know he's making the team. It's a nice way. I believe that. a little more in, in Ryan Weathers. Uh, For sure. I, I, many people had thought Sixto Sanchez might profile better as a reliever, even when he was coming up as a prospect. Um, and so I think that the injuries and some of the other guys who have emerged maybe make it seem like he will slide into the, the, uh, the bullpen role. Now, Tanner Scott hasn't looked good. No, it's possible that as the season works on Sixto Sanchez could work into high leverage innings. Um, sure. And that's intriguing. But Ryan Weathers, you know, leads spring training in strikeouts. Um, and we don't want to read too much into spring training numbers. But anytime you've struck out 21 guys in 18 innings and walked only four, um, that speaks to command and the effectiveness of your pitches. He's throwing harder. Um, his stuff just looks better than it's looked in the past. Um, he's only 24 years old. Um, there was, you know, he debuted for the Padres when he was like 21 Um, and he was always advanced because his dad was a major league pitcher. 
So there's there is a presence and a feel for pitching when you watch him on the mound. He just seems like utterly confident in everything he's doing, which I always and I kind of like gravitate towards pitchers like that because I think more often than not they can figure it out in a game if the, the stuff is there. And so I really like Weathers. Um, I'm happy to take late round gambles on him to start the year because I think, as you mentioned, he has a spot in the rotation and he's looked good and he's young and was at one time an interesting prospect. So let's yeah. see what he's got. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Mike with a question about another interesting uh, youngster. He said, should the Cleveland Guardians <laughs> erect the forthcoming Chase DeLauder statue at 6th and Eagle or ninth in Erie? Good question, Mike. He's had a great spring, mm -hmm. uh, DeLauder. And I think, you know, Kyle Manzardo got sent down too. Like, these are two guys to watch for sure. I think we'll see Manzardo first, but DeLauder, if he, if he hits in the minors to begin the year, I think he's like a May, June kind of guy. I wonder what you think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, so the, he has six games above high A. Well, that's the thing, yeah. In one year of professional baseball. Um, now, he was a college kid. He's 22. Um, so it it's not on – It's I think there's a very good chance that he will – be in the major leagues this year mm -hmm. um but people who are going to get upset that he doesn't break camp like there is a reason for that and also if you use the tool on baseball reference or you can look at the stats and look at the average opponent quality oh, of, that's right. um chase delotter's average opponent quality so the pitchers he's faced average out to about double a pitching so yes he's crushing the spring but he's crushing what he should be doing at double a which is where he may actually start the year um the interesting thing with the Guardians is like they have Esteban Floreal who has no options. So he needs to make the team. Um, and, you know, then there's Miles Straw, who I think has options, so they can demote Miles Straw. I think they're gonna give him another shot to see if there's anything there. Um, you have Ramon Loriano, who's always dealt with injuries. So I feel like by May or June, it's either an injury to Romano. Straw is just not worth a major league spot anymore. They gave Floriel a shot and nothing's happening. And any of those things open up the possibility of, of Chase DeLauder um, being, being called up. I will say, having never been to Cleveland in my life, so uh, one day I, I will. But I just think, if I think of Cleveland, ninth and Erie just sounds more Cleveland to me than sixth and Eagle. So to answer the actual question, I, I would say ninth and Erie probably. I was there for like 48 hours uh, once and I didn't go to a Guardians game. I don't think they were in town, unfortunately. Um, but I'd love to go back. Apparently a great city. Uh, all right. Dad with another question. Are we concerned? No. About <laughs> no, I know. I, I knew that was going to be the answer. Uh, Shota Imanaga has a 4.66 ERA this spring, but he has a 19 to two strikeout to walk ratio, right, yes. nine and two thirds innings. So, uh, yes. not not worried, not worried. No, not worried at all. Um, and I think that you should expect some inconsistencies from him early on in the year because I think you just have to remember that this is a guy adjusting to um, a new league, a new baseball. Um, all things like that, which I think will take some time to adjust. And so you'll see, you see things where like he has really good strikeout to walk ratios right now. I've been loving that. He's like throwing two O sliders and things like that. Um, yeah, but you know, we just have to let him adjust. I think it's interesting. Also, um, <clears throat> if you follow Lance Brozdowski's work um, on Twitter, and he has a Substack right. where he does a lot of pitching an uh, analysis, and he um, does a lot of work with the with the Cubs specifically. Anyway, he's yeah. noted that um, Imanaga's four seam fastball has been ninety three miles an hour with about eighteen or nineteen inches of, of vertical break um, in the spring. And in the World Baseball Classic, it was 94, 95 miles an hour with 21 inches of vertical break. Um, so that's still a lot of vertical break, but it's way less than he's had in the past. And so vertical break on a four seam is like what we used to call like a, ri a rising fastball where it doesn't actually rise, but it sinks less due to gravity as it approaches the plate than normal. So three inches of of losing three inches of rise is not nothing. Um, yeah. But again, 
that is likely more due with to him just adjusting to a different baseball. The World Baseball Classic did not use MLB baseballs. Um, so I think you'll just you'll see that settle as as time goes on. And I, I'm not concerned about his spring results. I love the way he's pitching. I love his his pitch mix. Um, I love the sequencing of his pitches. Um, and I I think he's one of my most rostered players this spring, and I will keep trying to get shares in my final drafts. Yeah, he's been a fun middle round target for me, kind of overshadowed a bit by Yamamoto, I think. Uh, different pitchers, to be sure. Um, you know, Yamamoto, Yamamoto has like the wipeout stuff, but I think right. Naga could be a really interesting fantasy pitcher, especially as the league adjusts and all the typical things that you see when a pitcher comes from overseas. Um, interesting question here. We still have a couple minutes uh, to close it out. So if you have, have any questions, have any draft questions, have any injury questions, prospect questions, whatever it might be, feel free to throw it in the chat here. Um, but I like this question. Uh, who is someone that you feel might have a sophomore slump? So dad, once again, mentions Andrew Abbott, Brian Wu, Bryce Miller, et cetera. So I was thinking about this and something that I think we should keep in mind with a pitcher like Bobby Miller, for example, when he gets to sort of uncharted territory innings wise, I do wonder if the Dodgers may back off a little bit with him. And they're kind of built in a way where like, Clayton Kershaw will come back late in the year. I do wonder if they'll manage his innings a bit if he starts to run into trouble. So I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about Nolan Jones <clears throat> with the Rockies. So he had a 400 batting average on balls in play uh, last year, which is like basically unprecedented. And, uh, and a strikeout rate around 30%. I'll say that for Matt McLean too. He had a strikeout rate around 30%. He had a batting average on balls in play. It was like 375. So you know that's going to come down. I'm basically saying that where if you look at the batting averages, you're like, oh, this is a good batting average play. For me, they're like 250 hitters is where I'm setting the baseline expectations. So not saying sophomore slump, but guys, I'm looking to, to regress a little bit. So I will I'm gonna I will answer this question, but I'm pushing back on the Matt McLean slander okay. first. He's, um, the speed is a factor. So like I'm well, not gonna deny the speed that. is a factor, but also um I, I wrote about him earlier on. We were doing one of our player preview articles and stuff because his called strike rate was twenty two percent. So he was not swinging and missing, which led to the high strikeout rate. He was super passive. Um, the yeah. called strikeout rate was much higher than anything he's done in the minors. He was pulling the ball way less than anything he did in the minors. All of that to me speaks to a player who was just a little bit more passive than normal on promotion to the major leagues. And so I think that you're going to see that get cut down a little bit. And so I think the strike rate will normalize a little for him because he's never had strike rates um, in the minor leagues that were that elevated. And I understand major league pitching is better, but you know, this is a guy who, you know, was striking up 20% of the time in triple a and then struck up 29% of the time in the majors. Um, I don't know if he's a 290 hitter, but I feel pretty good about something in the 270 range. Um, and then when you add the power speed into it, I think he's still an underrated uh, player. I um, I really still like Bobby Miller. Uh, Bryce Miller, I have some concerns about. I think the splitter is, you know, it's nice that he has another pitch. I don't love that the splitter is the pitch he went with. You know, I don't necessarily think it's the what he really needed. Um because he he needs uh, I just think he needed a better um, swing and miss pitch against a righties too. Um, I was I mean I think we saw Andrew Abbott already kind of regress in his final yeah. stretch of major league starts last year. So I, I would not surprise me if he didn't last long in the Reds rotation. Um, yeah. I think you're going to see regression for Tanner Bybee. Um, I still I still am fine with Tanner Bybee, but you know people. Uh, I was on, you know, Potapalooza before uh, the TGFBI draft, and somebody talked about him as an AL Cy Young candidate because he had a 2.98 ERA last year. But um, he doesn't miss a lot of bats. If you look at like heat maps and stuff, he threw a lot of breaking balls up in the zone. Um, that tends to not be a, a great recipe for success. You know, his Sierra was 4.19, which suggests that the, the you know the underlying metrics also didn't really believe his high twos ERA. So I think you'll see some regression from, from Tanner Bybee as well, but I think he'll still be useful. So like, yeah, he'll slump relative to last year, but you're not going to be mad. He's on your team. 
Uh, something about Andrew Abbott that I'll add. Uh, his fly ball rate last season was 51.7%. A little dangerous in Cincinnati. Didn't hurt him incredibly last year, but that's something I would I would watch for uh, with mm -hmm. him. Probably not someone I'm chasing on draft day. Uh, Shades, we mentioned Kyle Bradish as a stash candidate earlier, and you said you liked him. You know, it, it just comes down to the number of injuries that you're going to deal with right. in the course of a season. It's a luxury at the start mm -hmm. of the year because you hopefully don't have a lot of injured players. But, you know, by late April, you probably will have to make some tough choices. And, and you probably will know more about uh, Bradish by then and the timetable and how realistic it is that he'll return. Um, so, you know, maybe that decision's deferred for a little bit, but eventually you're going to have to make a, a decision. But to me, like sometimes I don't mind leaving a draft with a player I know is going to go on the injured list mm -hmm. um, because it's essentially an extra bench spot. And right. so I'm, I'm into that. I think all of those things, right, depend on your league settings too, right? Um, how many IL spots do you have? When are you running fab, right? When is your first waiver run? If your first waiver run is like, you know, after the the Padres Dodgers games, but before real games start, so I could draft Bradish, put him on the IL, pick somebody up and have that player before the season even starts, yeah. I'm getting an extra draft pick. Um mm -hmm. so, you know, all of those things are are fine, but I think you need to draft him knowing that you can't be precious when injuries happen to currently healthy players, right? Like I can't draft Bradish at a spot where all of a sudden other guys get hurt and I now don't have IL spots and I need to cut somebody who's injured and I don't want to cut Bradish because I picked him, you know, at X spot in the draft. Like I'm, I'm putting him on the, I'm drafting him in a place where I expect I might have to move on from him if other guys get hurt and I need to be okay with that. And so, you know, wherever that is in the draft may differ based on your risk tolerance, but you don't want to be stuck holding somebody who may not pitch for months just because you feel like you drafted him hot too high. For sure. So we'll close it out with this question. And I, I think this is a good, uh, good way to pop an article that we put together last week. We have this draft strategy mega round table. And this question was actually asked in that article. Mm -hmm. uh, so go to, NBC, go to NBCSports.com, go to the fantasy baseball section. You should be able to find it. Um, but this question, who are the players you have the most shares of across all of your leagues? And in that article, I said kind of an unsexy name, but I really have drafted him in a good percentage of my leagues, Jamie Candelario uh, yeah. with the Reds. And, you know, I, I I think the ballpark is, is part of it for sure. Um, the contract is part of it. Uh, we know he's going to play every day. In a really good year last year, and you know, if you go by the stat cast, you can go into the page and see, you know, if they played every game in a particular ballpark where they would have the most home runs. Last year, we would have had 31 home runs if you played mm -hmm. all his games in Cincy. Not really expecting that, but I expect really good production and in, in an interesting um, lineup. Uh, so he's he's one where like I've waited on third base, yeah, because yep. sometimes you do have to say commit to a, a plan. And he's one you've been able to get pretty late, like after Alec Bohm, after Key Brian Hayes, um, that deep. And I think he can be a respectable starting option at third base in a mixed league this year. I I love him. Um, you know, Scott and I talked about him on the the podcast, uh, which you can listen to the Road to World Baseball Show. Uh, make sure you go check that out wherever you get your podcasts. Um, that was Monday's episode where we did some spring training news and notes and risers and fallers. But I mentioned that. Like the projections have him for 22 home runs, which is less than he hit last year, and he's going to a better ballpark. And I don't think the projections are counting for his increased pull rate and fly ball rate from last year. And I don't see any reason why that wouldn't carry over to Cincinnati. Um, so I, I also really like that call. If I'm being just like fully transparent, um, you know, I go to my NFBC player page and then I can also add in from like my home leagues the guys i have the most shares of are uh dl hall wilson Contreras, shoto imanaga mason miller bailey ober hunter harvey and key brian hayes um oh and jake fraley 
now as well. And some of this is is wrapped up in like doing some draft and hold formats. So like Sal Frelick is somebody I really liked in draft and hold formats because I think um, he has some speed and the Brewers are going to play him all over the field. And so I think he gets, you know, multi-position eligibility and um, will pick up speed for me. D.L. Hall is somebody I wrote about in an article on, on Roto World that you can read, um, which is um, – Pitchers being currently, you know, undrafted or outside the top 100 who could finish as top 25 starting pitchers. I love D.O. Hall. We talked about Imanaga. Wilson Contreras is being criminally undraft- underdrafted. Um, yeah. I think he's a top five catcher for me. Uh, Mason Miller, you know, I love, you know, Jeff Zimmerman's Mining the News stuff is great. He yeah. wrote something a month ago. He clipped something that said that Mason Miller would mul- work in multi innings and Mason Miller's draft stock dropped. And then the San Francisco Chronicle put out an article last week that said he could close and the draft price hasn't changed at all. Um, so <laughs> I guess because the A's. Right. I'm but drafting you know, Mason. play a lot of low scoring games, which sometimes and, works to your advantage. And even if he's in multi innings to start the year, like we know he has electric stuff. So I'm going to get multiple innings of him with plus strikeouts. And then maybe he saves 10 to 15 games during the year. But if his draft price right now is as like your third reliever, yeah. Then that's that's a great cost. Um, and then Bailey Ober, Bailey Ober, we've talked about him so much. Um, right. I was getting a lot of shares early before the the price rose. And keep Ryan Hayes. I, I believe in the power that we saw at the end of last year to the to the tune of, that I think he's like a fifteen to twenty homer guy rather than like a twelve to fifteen homer guy um, with a two seventy average and you know some steals and a solid actually kind of like solid Pittsburgh lineup. Um, yeah, so I, I have a fair amount of shares of him. And then Jake Fraley, I started buying yeah, up, up before the, the Frito injury. And now I'm, you know, and then he, he fouled a ball off of his uh, groin yesterday uh, and had to be removed from the game. And that sounded terrible, but he yeah. should be okay. Um, so thank God. You know. Um, <laughs> Logan O'Hoppy is someone I've been on in, yeah. in a lot of leagues too. And it pains me to say this, but I think he can be a better fantasy catcher than Francisco Alvarez this year. Yes, prob- probably. Probably. Um, I also should just note I, I have a fair amount of shares of Stephen Kwan as well um, as just an unsexy, like he's going to hit at the top of that lineup. That lineup isn't great, but it wasn't great last year and he scored 93 runs. So he still could push for over 90 runs, which is an undervalued category. Um, he's going to get some steals. He'll hit for a high batting average. And the interesting thing is that the guardians are leaning into trying to drive the ball more right um early in the count and if they swing and miss that's fine they're trying to do damage early in the count rather than like passively watch a pitch go by and listen Quan is not going to then all of a sudden hit 20 home runs but if he even gets you know he hit 7 last year i believe if he gets to 10 to 12 but is putting up close to 20 stolen bases while scoring 90 runs like that, that is a useful player depending on the build you have going. If you're in like leagues where you need to roster five outfielders, I think he can round out an outfield fairly well. Awesome. So we are going to cut it off here, but uh, thanks for all the great questions. Um, and next Tuesday, 1 PM, uh, we're going to do another Q and a, we'll be doing that throughout the regular season as well. So um, set a reminder and you can join us every week. Good luck if you're drafting this week. Uh, once again, the Rotowell Baseball Draft Guide uh, can help you with that. We're going to update that throughout the week uh, to help you guys with your drafts. But until then, listen to the Rotowell Baseball Show. You can follow me on Twitter at DJ Short. Uh, and Eric is Samsky NYC. Take care, everyone. We will see you soon. See you.